welcome back. This is Dr. Jay Smith and also Mel from Sneakers Corner. It seems like the last two videos that we've just put up this week have really gone viral uh, with over 20,000 uh, viewings for both videos. And the one we just put on concerning who really Muhammad is, the original Muhammad, uh, have we found him or has Mel found him, I should say, has certainly gone quickly to the top. So because of that, we wanted to do a third follow-up video. Now, this is, some, this is new material that Mel has been looking at. He's been putting it together. He's coming up with conclusions. You may not necessarily agree with all his conclusions. That's okay. That's okay. This is why we're doing this. These are what we call white papers. Uh, these are basically what-if scenarios, possible scenarios because of the evidence that we're finding. Now, remember, remember, we've always said that we're interested in what's happening in the 7th century. We've already given up on the 9th and 10th century. We made that make very clear in all of our videos. It is too late. It is too far away. Interestingly, the 9th and 10th traditions all come from Iraq. Iraq. Well, that's interesting. Okay, let's come back here again because things were happening in Iraq. Things were going on in Iraq in the 7th century as well. And that's why Mel, as a historian, this is what historians, all historians should do. Whenever you are introduced with material from a certain century, for heaven's sakes, go back to that century. Go back to where those events happened. Go back to where those events not only happened, but where the names, dates, places are coming out of. Investigate them on their own terms. Don't try to impose traditions written two to three hundred years later onto those names, dates, and places, try to find out what actually happened. That is the historical method, and that's what we're going to be doing, and that's what we've asked all of you to do. We've been looking at some of the comments. Mel and I are going to do some more sessions where we're going to answer your questions. Hold on. There's lots of good questions there, but many of you Muslims especially, you keep on saying, that isn't true because of so-and-so says this in Al-Buhari and Sahih Muslim and Ibn Daud and Ibn, uh, also Ibn Hisham. You keep on trying to, try to bring us back to those traditions. We've said we're not interested in those traditions anymore. Are you getting it, Muslims? Everybody else is getting it, but you don't seem to be. We are interested in the 7th century, and we want to debunk the, uh, what the Islam has been in, or we want to debunk, uh, debunk the Islam of the 9th and 10th century imposed onto the 7th century. We're going to keep reminding you of this. So let's now go back. I've invited Mel to come back. He's been so, uh, he's been so generous. And he has also been working enormously hard to get this material into one place up so we can see it. He's got a great PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to invite him now. Mel, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Jay. Uh, great to be back. It's hard to believe it was three months ago we did the last video, even though it seems like it's just come out. But uh, yeah, yeah. People um, were, were saying, be careful <laughs> of your bicycle tour. And I kept on saying, well, wait a minute. That actually happened back in June. <laughs> but yeah. he's now back at home. You're back where you're supposed to be. And you're really yeah. digging into this new material. And Mel, you've, you now uh, start and give us an introduction as to what, you're, what you mean by the Iraqi scenario before we get into the PowerPoint. Yeah, um, so the Iraqi thesis is basically a collection of different data points, which all points to an origin for Islam, which is up in the Iraqi region. Um, we saw in the, the first video that we did in this series where I looked at the rock inscriptions, um, there was a lot of evidence pointing to um, a kind of a pre-Islam period during the seventh century where there was an absence of Muhammad. So, Going into this second video that we did, what I was doing is not just saying, okay, he didn't exist, which some people yeah. misinterpreted that video. I was saying, okay, there must be a reason he, he's not on the rock inscriptions because he should have been. Yeah. And a good reason would be that perhaps whatever figure the whole myth or legend of Muhammad is based on, he must have gone under another name. Because if we, if we think back to uh, what Robert Spencer had said, he referred to Muhammad as likely being a title, which I would agree with too. So in terms of that uh, second video, then the, the whole point of that was to show that, okay, if there was a real person, let's look at the sources. Um, what would fit the bill? So when we look at some of the earliest sources that we have, there's a number of things that is required. 
he has to be connected to a tribe called the Taiyage. That's one of the mm -hmm. earliest sources. Um, and there are also multiple sources, which I didn't even go through all of them, but there's multiple sources that contradict the Islamic tradition from the seventh century that call him a king. Now we can dispute about what exactly they meant by king. Was he a governor? Was he just simply elected by the other Arabs? And uh, you know, that's, that's where we were going with the, the second one. And so I looked at who was the prominent person in the, the right time frame. I found from multiple sources, uh, a guy called Iyas Ibn uh, Kabisha al Tai, which means that he belonged to the Tai or Tayaye tribe. And, uh, and then I just went from there and I just looked at the different information to see whether there was multiple things pointing to uh, an identity between him and the legend of Muhammad. And from my point of view, um, trying to be as objective as possible, I felt there was a really strong case that these were one and the same person. Now, um, there, were, there was a viewer on the channel that pointed out that this would mean that Muhammad is a Persian proxy, if, if all of this is true. Um, and obviously that's, that means that if he was, that, that's a huge yeah. challenge to the Islamic tradition that paints yeah. him as a really patriot, patriotic Arab. Um, there was also another viewer um, who also identified his son's name, which I think was Farrar, as a Persian name. So th that's a double kind of whammy for the Islamic tradition. But um, there's a little surprise in store in, in our presentation today that follows up on that. So even though this, um, my conclusions threw up the possibility that there's a Persian connection, um, I was able to find another source that's rarely mentioned on the internet, which also reinforces that perception of a Persian connection. Right. Listen, why don't you go ahead and start putting up the PowerPoint? I'm just going to make sure that people understand when you say Iraqi, we're talking about the Euphrates, the Tigris, that what used to be called Mesopotamia. This is the area that is Iraq today. So when we say Iraq, we mean Iraq today. But is that area much further northeast of Mecca and Medina? This is the, where a lot of your great history has taken place, ancient great history. And it, it's between those two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, where we're now heading into. Now, remember, in, up until the seventh century, that was Persian. That was a Sassanian area. That was the Persian Empire. Khosra and these great kings uh, are from that area. So just so people don't get confused. Secondly, we are getting lots of questions concerning what does this say about the Petran, uh, the whole Petran uh, narrative. We're going to be answering that, not necessarily in this lecture. We'll be doing a Q&A after this. We'll be putting up the Q&As, and we'll be taking every one of your uh, questions, the, be the best questions. We put together the best questions, and we will uh, help you and unpack and show you that this does not contradict, nor does it confront the Petrin, Dan Gibson's material on the Petrin uh, narrative. Uh, we, we, you'll see that it actually uh, accommodates it very well and complements it quite nicely. So over to you, Mel. Thank you, Jay. Um, so just on, in terms of the title, I've called it the Iraqi thesis. But there is, as you will see, a strong Persian element to this. So I may come up with a new name for this thesis later. But for now, I think it serves its purpose. So the geographical information in the Quran is consistent with uh, a more northerly location in the Hejaz. Let's look at one example of an internal clue from the Quran for a geographical setting. So if, if you can see there, Surah 74, 50 to 51 says, as though they were panicked donkeys fleeing from a line. So if, if you can imagine this is a scene that's supposedly occurring in the Hejaz, would this scene fit there or would it fit more appropriately with Iraq? And uh, two possible uh, animals that might fit this would be the Syrian wild uh, ass and the Asiatic lion. Okay, so really the possibilities with that could be over on the left hand side, you see where the Jordan is, where Petra is. There is Iraq over on the right up at the top. And then there's way down south in the blistering heat of uh, uh, the Hejaz, we have Mecca. So those are the three possibilities. Now, um, 
you can see there the, the various Arabic words that are used in that passage. Uh, humarum, referring to donkeys or asses, and then the Arabic word kaswara, which uh, can refer to a lion or a beast of prey. Now, the thing is, the Asiatic line, uh, let me just read the bit I want, became extinct in Arabia deserta, in other words, the Hejaz, millennia, millennia ago, thousands of years ago, but it still existed in Mesopotamia or Iraq right up to the 20th century. Now, so in terms of just that first initial clue and, and you know, one of the things I would encourage the audience not to view this as an academic paper because um, I want you to kind of put that aside because there's a lot of ego around that sort of thing. I want you just to view this as the notes of a detective where we're just examining the clues and then thinking through all the different clues, joining the dots and trying to see what the picture is, okay? Now, I am going to actually shoot myself in the foot for a moment because yes, I could easily say this is a piece of evidence to, to prove that the Quran wasn't written in the Hejaz, but I, you know, someone could, as, a, as a, an objection say, well, the person could have been writing this in the Hejaz, but talking about a visit they'd been to somewhere else. And this shows up the, the, the problem with assuming that because the locations mentioned in the Quran are in say Petra or uh, Hejaz, we can't assume that that's where the Quran was written or that's where the person associated with the beginning of Islam was from. That's a false assumption, I'm going to say. Now, so, so many of the locations mentioned in the Quran cluster around Petra, okay, that's a given. And I think D Dan Gibson has done a fine job at demonstrating that uh, conclusively. Um, the focus is on Petra, that's, that's, that is correct, and it is romanticized, much the same as the Babylonian Jews focused on a romanticized Jerusalem. Um, however, the locations that are mentioned in the Quran don't necessarily mean that the Quran was produced or written there. Let me just jump so in here real quickly, yeah, uh, yeah. Mel. Just, just to give people background on this, uh, one of the things that Dan has come up with and the reason why Petra is so important is because the Nabataeans, that was their city of tombs and temples. That is where they buried their people. Remember, the, the Nabataeans were traders, so they were trading all the way out to China and India. They were going all over the the known world at that time. But because of the fact they didn't really have their own empire and they didn't have their own political uh, entity, they were much more, they were in and out of many people's empires. Petra then had a special focus, special, enormous focus more above and beyond what we would consider uh, today. Much like you say the Jews had a focus on Jerusalem, so did the Nabataeans have this focus on Petra. That explains then why Petra became the focal point for all the temples that were that were uh, that were had a kibla. That means they had a direction of their prayers always towards Petra as well. Because this comes up in the question all the time: Why would they, why why, why would they need to be facing towards Petra? Why would they need to be facing towards the city because they didn't really have a political environment uh, environment there? I hope that ex ex answers that and also gives supports what you're saying. These two actually accommodate each other quite well. Yeah. So this theory is, is not really meant to say that Petra is wrong, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Um, this is supplementary uh, material to the Petra thesis. Obviously, some parts of the Petra thesis uh, will have to um, be um, reworked to, to, to fit with this, perhaps. But that's all part of the process of uh, looking at hypotheses and, and, and then moving on to theories, you know, I change my hypothesis on, you know, with every new fact I come across. So that's, you know, that's to be expected. But um, just to give you two parallels, Bram, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, set mostly in Romania, while he was living in England and never set foot in Romania. The book is arguably as equally vivid there as it is in Whitby, where he had visited. So if you think about it, just because Bram Stoker, Bram Stoker even, uh, wrote about Romania doesn't mean he wrote it in Romania. And likewise, James Joyce wrote Ulysses while living in Paris. And despite his remarkable intimate knowledge of Dublin, 
it was entirely from memory. And it's, I, I don't know if, if many of your audience have, have read that book. It has 250,000 words, um, a unique vocabulary of 35,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you could nearly draw a map of Dublin from it. It's incredibly detailed. And yet the amazing thing is he wasn't in Dublin while he was, while he was writing this. Amazing. So the same thing could apply with the Quran. It doesn't require people to be living there, but it definitely shows a, a great um, interest in the whole Nabataean area for obvious reasons. It's, it's close to the heart of the Arabs being, you know, the heart of the, uh, the, the previous Arab empire. So, that, you know, there's good reasons for Petra to be the focus. So just moving on then from that, what may be more revealing is thinking about the audience, the stories referred to and the language used, you know, um, I, I've done a little bit of writing in my past, and I'm sure many of you may have done so too. And you may remember your teacher whenever you wrote an essay, say, think about the audience. It's all about the audience. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. Who is the audience? Let's think about who is the Quran talking to? Where are they? That's a key thing. What language is being used which would suit that audience? So all of these things thinking about the language, the words used, the stories that are alluded to, all tell you a lot about the audience. So essentially this would give us um, a drawing, if you like, of the audience. You know, the way a detective might hear a description of a criminal and they get an artist to draw what they think the criminal would look like. He's got a big nose, he's got red hair and he's such a height. Well, all of this evidence gives us a picture of the audience. And then if we think about where is the audience, we know where the Quran was written. So this is the logic behind my thesis. Okay, so what you will probably um, easily see when you read the Quran is it makes allusions to stories without retelling them. And I think Jay, you spoke to me before that there, there was either no story fully told or maybe just one story. Do you remember? You're finding, and this is what Patricia, Patricia Crone came up with, uh, that is that lots of the stories that you see in the Quran, they don't have beginnings, they don't have end, which suggests that they are borrowed and introduced knowing that the audience already knew the story. That's why you yeah. would not have to give an introduction and a, and a conclusion. You just refer to it in passing, like we do, like you just did with Bra uh, Bram Stoker. You just give and you mention it. You don't give the whole story. You just talk about it. Yeah. But and that by doing that, that shows that the audience was familiar with it. And that's what yeah. you see all through the Quran. And many times you, you even can... give contradictory, contradictory stories. If you look and see with Abraham, uh, you can see two different stories about the Kaaba that, that actually contradict each other. So this is typical of Qusas. These are what known as storytellers of which the Quran is fully made up of. And that's why people haven't really looked at that uh, because it seems to suggest exactly what you're saying here. Uh, that there's been a retelling and a retelling, but they, they embellish it or they take away or they add to it, depending on what the need is for that audience. I heard someone tell a story. It's kind of a funny story about a couple of criminals in a prison and they're used to telling each other jokes, but of course they're telling the same jokes all the time. So eventually they get to the point where they don't even have to tell the joke to make the other person laugh. They just say what number the joke is. So one person <laughs> says, that. it's no, you know, it's, Someone says it's two and they, they all start laughing and no, someone else says number one and they all start laughing because they remember the joke. So essentially the Quran is doing something similar. Yeah. So this presupposes that the original audience is familiar with the story stories and it also presupposes that these stories existed and this is really important in language that the audience could understand. So if we know what language the stories were originally written in, that would suggest that the audience also spoke that language because that's the way they would have heard the story. Let me just, so, let me just interject. Let me just give you this quote from Patricia Corona herself. I've just pulled it yeah. up here, uh, which she yeah. said in her 1987 Meccan trade. She says, as storyteller followed upon storyteller, the recollection of the past is reduced to a common stock of stories, themes, and motifs that could be re uh, combined and recombined into a profusion of apparently factual accounts. Each combination and recombination would generate new details, and as spurious information accumulated, genuine information would be lost. 
In the absence of an alternative tradition, early scholars were forced to rely on the tales of storytellers, as did Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, and other historians. It is because they relied on the same repertoire of tales that they all said much the same or similar things. So that supports what you're just saying. She found that out. She, in her studies, you're finding it out in your research. Yeah, it's really amazing uh, when you do research how much you see other scholars saying the same sort of thing, except they, they had a completely different line of, of research and, and you discover they have uh, come to the same conclusion. So that's, come in. that's quite reassuring. So if we look at the location of spoken um, Aramaic in the 7th century, this is a rough uh, indication, I've just drawn this myself, um, of where you will find Aramaic in the 7th century. Now, since this time, Aramaic has uh, been reduced in these areas because other, other languages have taken over, mostly Arabic. Um, so, but that's, this is... Um, Can you say something, Mel, here about the, how that Aramaic is a precursor to Arabic? Yes, um, they are both uh, Semitic languages. Um, there is evidence to suggest that while um, Arab Arabic is a sister language to Aramaic, um, the, the line of influence is from Aramaic to Arabic rather than the other way around. Um, but to, there'll be more on that later. Uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hold off on that for the moment. But the key thing to note at this stage is that in the area of Iraq, which is mostly the part that's on the right hand side, uh, where the, the rivers Euphrates and the Tigris are, um, that's the key area of interest to us. Um, and as you can see also, Petra is over in another Aramaic area where the Nabataean script came from. Um, I'm going to be talking about the different dialects of Aramaic in the different areas because that's actually another key bit of information that can allow us to get, go from, say, a low resolution picture of what went on to a much higher resolution picture. But first of all, we'll look at the lower resolution picture and then we'll zero in on, on, on more uh, high resolution points about this. Okay. So why is this map important? So Syriac or Syro-Aramaic uh, stories would more likely be known to those who spoke Aramaic. These Aramaic stories are merely alluded to in the Quran as if the audience doesn't need to be told them or don't need to be told them. The text is in dialogue with Syriac Christian literature such as that concerning the seven sleepers and the two-horned one, Dul al karnain in Surah 18. 70% of the Quran's foreign words are Aramaic, which uh, shows a very close connection between the Quran and Aramaic, including some of the most important wor words for Islam. The Quran comes from Kiriana, which is an Aramaic, Aramaic word which means lectionary, and then Surah and Ayah. Now, the word Ayah we often translate it to mean verse, but actually, in the original, it can have two meanings, and the primary meaning would be a sign or miracle. So that's why in some parts of the Quran, you, you see the Quran talking about um, that the eyes will you know, convince you and, and persuade you, and they are proofs and so on. So that's what the primary meaning of it was. Now, um, we also find certain words that have caused a lot of confusion, like for example, the word Huri, which you find in the Quran. Um, now, Christoph Luxemburg um, first referred to this really, and he came up with a theory which was often panned, which said that it related to grapes, and people thought, oh, that's a bit silly. But, um, but it actually relates, in terms of uh, where you find that in the Quran, it relates to such things as Ephraim's hymns. And if you were to, to look at the the, the themes in those surahs and compare it to Ephraim the Syrian, you'll find a, a very strong connection between the two. So this kind of helps us to see again this Aramaic connection. Um, there is a very important word called tur, or tur, depending on how you pronounce it. Just um, which, that last slide, I know a lot of people. Do you want to go back a bit? Just go one but slide back again to the... One more again? No, that's fine. Right there, the hoodies. The, you're talking about the hoodie there. 
Uh, the, go back, go forward now. One slide. Oh, the Huri, sorry. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah that one, Huri. Uh, one of the one of the, the joke that's been going on is if this is the case, if these are nothing more than um, than pieces of grape, the seventy two yeah. virgins that are waiting for the men in heaven uh, will be nothing more than grapes. So you can see that this significant as to what these are these women or are these grapes waiting for them, and of course the yeah. uh, the it will it completely changes the scenario of what heaven's going to be like for a, for a Muslim, uh, if depending on how you and which word you're going to look at and how you interpret it. Yeah. Um, you know, some people out there might think, oh, that's silly. Uh, grapes isn't much of a reward in heaven. But there is a fresco that was found uh, in the 20th century in Egypt. So right next door to Arabia. And in it, it has the figure of Abraham, a very important figure for, for Arabs, feeding the souls in heaven with grapes. So this is obviously symbolic of the rewards of heaven. So for later um, Muslims in the 8th and 9th century to misinter misinterpret that to mean something entirely different um, is kind of embarrassing when you think about it. They've, they've failed to see the symbolic meaning and they've gone for a literal meaning based on a misinterpretation of the word. Or this is intentional. This is intentional or to intentional, bring more people yeah. on side. To yeah. make it much, a, much greater, a, a, a much greater reward for the men who are probably questioning, what's the purpose of doing all yeah. this? this uh, yeah. Why should we join Islam? Well, look what's waiting for you on the other end. So it could be yeah. either way, that they, but they have taken the word, and you're right, in this case, it looks yeah. like they have mis misinterpreted it. But particularly at a time when the caliphs were decadent, you know, they had massive harems, and this was, uh, you know, viewed as the, the ultimate thing to have, you know? So, yeah, so... If we look then at that word tour, it's, um, it's a word which occurs in the Quran, it occurs seven times, but it isn't an Arabic word, and it actually isn't used in Arabic even today, apart from in the Quran. It's a foreign word. Um, it is uh, an Aramaic word, and it, it's not just Aramaic, as we'll see in a, in a moment, it's, it's actually from a particular dialect of Aramaic, which is Mandaic. Um, in terms of the spelling, it's consistent with, with uh, Mandaic, uh, Aramaic. Now, there's also some words which are Arcadian in origin, which is an ancient Babylonian language. Um, and it is possible that they entered via Babylonian Aramaic as Akkadian had died out centuries before. So, for example, Fahar, pottery, Furat, fresh water, and Souk, which is street, and Azawir, bracelets. So these words show up in the Quran, creating lots of problems for um, Muslims to try and understand what they mean. But the fact that they came into the Quran would suggest if you if you look at the the red circle, or well, it's not quite a circle, but you know what I mean. Um, you'll see Babylon there, and you see um, where the words Tigris and Euphrates are. So that really that area there, all the way up to the northern Mesopotamia, gone up as far as Edessa. That's the area where Akkadian had been spoken. So if those words were used, somehow the, that language had died out, but it, some of the words were retained in Aramaic in the local dialect, which was the Babylonian dialect of Aramaic. I hope that makes sense. So there isn't just one dialect across all this area. There's actually at least four different dialects um, of Aramaic around the different parts of um, this area. There may be more, but four is, is the, the ones that I've found so far. Um, now, the other thing is, as you can see from the tafsir, that I'm not making this up, that they didn't know what the word tour meant. And <laughs> they actually had to explain it in the tafsir. Every mount is a tour, as in the Syriac and Coptic languages. So there you go. Islamic, sorry, the Islamic sources are even agreeing with me that this word is a Syriac word, comes from the Aramaic. So that they had to explain it because it's not in the Arabic language. Now, um, so where is one example of where the word tour occurs? Surah 52.1 begins with what tour on the mount? The problem is that the Arabic word for mountain is Jabal. For example, Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses. But this opening part follows the style of the Babylonian or Mandaic incantation that has a long cultural history that goes all the way back to Akkadian, 1000 BC, and even Sumerian times, 4000 BC. 
So I'm looking at this now from an anthropological point of view. I'm, I'm thinking about where this word was used, what cultural setting uh, was it used, and trying to see, okay, if the Quran came from Babylon or that, that area. Now, that's, I'm using the word Babylon just to make it clear for people. Obviously, it wasn't called Babylon in the 7th century. It was, was called that in earlier times. Um, but the word tour has been found on Mandaic Aramaic incantations. These are spells, essentially, that were drawn on pottery, and um, people have found lots of examples of these. Now, I'll just give you one example. The ancient Mesopotamian incantation series, Sherpu, says the following. My illness, my weariness, my guilt, my crime, my sin, my transgression, the illness that is present in my body, my flesh and my veins, be peeled off like this garlic so that the fire god, the burner, consumes it today. May the curse leave so that I may see the light. Now, um, there was a strong culture going, if you can imagine this, going back 5,000 years in that whole area of casting spells and spells were used defensively and offensively so if you had an enemy you cast a spell on them if you wanted to protect yourself against other people's spells um, you would create another spell as a defensive uh, line and this is like harry potter stuff but the evidence suggests that this was still a strong part of the culture in that area at the time of the seventh century so it's important that we bear that in mind now here's an example of uh, Babylonian Aramaic uh, incantation. It's an incantation bold written in the Aramaic language. It comes from that area of Babylon, it's Mesopotamia. It's dated somewhere between the fourth and seventh century and it's in the Bergamon Museum in Berlin. And if we analyze the surah, we actually, at least according to me, I haven't heard anyone else say this, but based on what I know from the cultural background, this is my interpretation, so I may be wrong, but it seems to me that this is a fair interpretation. So when a person casts a spell, what they do is they call on the powers of nature. And so they refer to different objects around them and they basically take the powers of nature to those objects, if you like. And then once they've gathered all of these occult powers, they project it in a curse towards whatever it is they want to direct it towards. And they spell out, pardon the pun, uh, what, they want to happen to the person, okay? So you can see there by the Mount Tour and a book inscribed in a pu published scroll and the frequented house and the elevated roof and the seething sea. So this um, surah is often be depicted as more poetic than other parts, but there's a reason behind it. I would suggest that it's part of a magical formula. The punishment of your Lord is coming. There is nothing to avert it. On the day when the heaven sways in agitation, and the mountains go in motion, Woe on that day to the deniers, those who pay with speculation, the day when they were shoved into the fire of hell forcefully. This is the fire which you used to deny. And then it says, interestingly, is this magic or do you not see? So um, that's my suggestion on, on what it means. Um, now, there is an obvious uh, objection. This is ridiculous smell. You know, there are no spells in the Quran. Muslims don't cast spells, do they? They don't curse each other. Well, three days after I uh, prepared this PowerPoint, I saw a very interesting tweet from someone who you might have heard of. Have you ever heard of Ali Dawa? <laughs> um, <laughs> Ali Dawa, as if to prove my point, um, said the following. I'm just moving uh, these videos on my way. So those of you, for those of you who don't know who we're talking about, Ali Dawa is a very well-known, uh, he's a protagonist from Speaker's Corner there in London. Uh, actually, we've had lots of contact with him over the years. And he is right now, as we're speaking, in a real confrontation with David Wood and uh, apostate prophet, along with Muhammad Hijab. So the four of them are, and this is where this tweet comes from, I'm assuming, because it's August 24th. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. So literally just a few days ago. So this is what he says. Every Muslim should, should say Amin and retweet this. May Allah cause a disease or an illness to inflict those individuals who have desecrated the Quran. May it be so severe that they never forget till the day they die and in the hereafter. Amin, remember this tweet. So after um, sharing my information about the incantations, what I discovered from lots of viewers on my channel that actually there are 
loads and loads and loads of references in the Islamic traditions to um, the use of spells and incantations. And, uh, you know, I find it quite disturbing. I don't know about you, but in the Christian tradition, um, we're encouraged to, to um, bless everyone, not to curse people. Um, yes, Cursing is only, only for God. You're right. And only he can curse. We are not permitted to curse. And that's yeah. why it's very clear that we have a completely different paradigm. And that's why when we see things like this, uh, we, it, it, we find it is not only symptomatic of that, that worldview, it's also symptomatic of their scriptures and symptomatic, as you're saying, of that which has been going on in that part of the world for some centuries. Yeah. So could the early story of the Quran reflect possibly differences over Aramaic dialects long since hushed up? So now we're going to look at this issue of uh, different dialects. Now, if we look at volume six, book 61, number 510, this is one that you, you often refer to, Jay. Hudaifa bin al-Yaman came to Uthman. Hudaifa was afraid of the people of Sham and Iraq's differences in the recitation of the Quran, okay? So there's a problem between the people of Sham, which is Syria, and those of Iraq, in terms of the recitation of the Quran. It doesn't say exactly why, but Al-Bukhari says again, uh, we just focus on that line again. Hudaifu was afraid of their, the people of Sham and Iraq, differences in the recitation of the Quran. So if we analyze it from the point of view of Aramaic, it makes perfect sense. There are two separate dialects um, that we can identify and verify. So this is not just a uh, wild, goose, uh, wild goose chase or just uh, me just coming up with a mad idea here. We can verifiably say that there are two separate dialects in these regions, one Syro-Aramaic and one Babylonian Aramaic. Okay. Now, so if we look at that text again in light of that, it starts to make sense in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. Why did the people of Shams and Iraq have differences in the recitations of the Quran? It doesn't say what language these recitations were in. It is just assumed it must be Arabic through the eyes of the ninth century. And notice the following. Uthman sent a message to Haifa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the, material, sorry, the manuscripts to you. Now, um, it is assumed that the people of Shams and Iraq had bad copies of the original, i.e. There, there were scribal errors in the text, but they could have been in two different dialects. What would stop it from happening again? Like, scribal errors happened the first time. If that's true, then they could happen again. Um, but the other possibility is that the reason for this is that they were in separate dialects and there needs to be conformity between these two dialects. Now, the problem there is that if you choose one dialect over another, there's going to be one group of people that won't fully understand the text, whereas the other group will. So that's the problem. And essentially, then it becomes a power struggle. Who has got more sway, the, the Syrians or the Iraqis? If we assume that I'm correct on, on, in terms of my uh, interpretation. See, I believe that before the Quran was in Arabic, there was an original set of documents which were um, in Aramaic, perhaps in different forms of Aramaic. And this is the, the, the background to, to my thinking, if people don't follow me. Can I, can I just interject real quickly here? Muslims will come back to you on this and say, no, you're getting it wrong on this, Mel. Mm -hmm. uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that there is a co competition between two dialects up in the north. This had more to do with the fact that the Qureshi, that the Qureshi dialect, I know you're going to get into this, the Qureshi mm -hmm. dialect, which is unique to the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia, is the true dialect. This is the one that Muhammad spoke, therefore this is the one that the Quran was initially revealed to in. And this is the one that would exist in heaven. Uh, we can, that's a whole other story. We're not getting into that. And yeah. that's why Hudaifa, when he comes and returns back down to Medina and uh, says to uh, Uthman, what are we going to do? We do not want to have the uh, many different Qurans like the Christians and Jews. We must bring it back to one Quran, the original Quran, the Qureshi Quran. And that's why then Uthman then turns around and burns those others from Shams and Iraq after he gets this final Qureshi dialect uh, or yeah. the Qureshi Quran and sends it to five cities. Look at three of those cities are in Iraq, two in Iraq and uh, one in Syria, sorry. So you can see that by doing that, he is 
okay, what Muslims will say, and I, I, you're, I know you're going to answer this, but the Muslims will say this has nothing to do with the competition of those northern dialects. It's the eradication of those northern dialects because of the fact that Qureshi is the standard that is in heaven and is also that what Muhammad would have spoken. Yeah. So I'm going to suggest there, in, in, on, on this point, there's not just a hole in the Islamic tradition. There is a grand canyon in the Islamic tradition, and I'm going to drive a stagecoach and, and uh, horses right through it now. Um, there is no tribe called Quraysh that I could find in the seventh century. <laughs> I love this. This is why it's so good. <laughs> good on you. I uh, right on. There is um, clear evidence that the tribe that Muhammad belonged to was the Tayyayi. That's their earliest sources. There is no earlier than that. So our very first mention in the seventh century clearly says the Tayyayi of Muhammad. You can't get around that. So this 8th and ninth century myth of a Quraysh um, tribe that Muhammad belongs to um, is wrong. And I'm going to show you how that mistake, which probably was partly accidental, partly on, on purpose, but I'm going to show you why this mistake entered the Islamic tradition and where it came from. Now, it does require a little bit of devilment in terms of uh, linguistics and a lot of playing around with letters, which is not something that is beyond the possibility of the, of, uh, the Islamic tradition to do, because as we can see in lots of different examples, there is a lot of covering up and changing and editing and deleting and so on. And this is just another example of a long, long list of uh, manipulation going on since the seventh century. So without further ado, um, Hafsa sent to it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered Zaid bin Tabit, Abdullah bin Azubair, uh, Said bin Alas, and Abdur Rahman bin Harith bin Hisham to write the manuscripts in perfect copies. Uthman said to the three Qureshi men, In case you disagree with Zaid bin Tabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. The Quran was revealed in their tongue. Okay, now. Here's the problem. This is the hole in the Islamic narrative that I want to point out. The dispute is between um, Syria and Iraq. So we have two sides here, Zaid bin Tabit, he represents one side. And then on the other side, there are three people who represent the side of the Quraysh. Now, just looking at it objectively, just in terms of the plain meaning and context, you'd have to say that one of them represents the Syrian side, side in the dispute, and the other three represents the Iraqi side. That makes logical sense. Now, if we go further and think about that word Quraysh, it actually comes up with an answer. You see, the Jews referred themselves, sorry, they, the Jews are sometimes referred to as the sons of Israel, Bani Israeli, or Ban, Bani Israel. But they refer to um, Iraqis as Bani Quraysh. So when Uthman said to the three Qureshi men, in case you disagree with Zaid bin Tabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. The Quran was revealed in their tongue. I believe that the Qureshi dialect refers to the Babylonian dialect found at that time in Iraq. Therefore, Abdullah bin Azubair, Said bin Alas, and Abdur Rahman bin Harith bin Hisham were Iraqi. They were not from the Hejaz, as later thought. And I know there are going to be people, particularly the linguists, who will say, yeah, but that's a K, and we're dealing with a Q, and so on. Yes, it does sound like it, but there's, it's a different letter. So, you know. Let me just say this, this real quickly. Yeah. For people who've jumped on you on that, how do you spell yeah. the word Quran today? K O R A N or Q U R apostrophe A N? Are not both correct? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it, this this yeah. is a non this is a this is a non argument whether it's K or Q. It's it's linguistic how you hear it how you sound how you uh, say. It. We used to always say all the time whenever I talked about you must keep to the three C's: quick, concise, yet comprehensive. Well. Okay, so there's a Q in there, but it sounds like a C. So we even do that in English. So that, that would be a non-argument non as far as we're concerned. Yeah. So the Quraysh is written in this letter in the Arabic, and those of you who are Arabic speakers will be able to tell me what it is. I've, I've forgotten, and I didn't get a chance to just uh, remind myself. And uh, Cyrus 
is written with uh, this letter in Hebrew. So when it says um, Koresh, the original meaning is it refers to Cyrus. So the Iraqis were referred to the sons of Cyrus, Cyrus being um, a very famous person from uh, uh, centuries before, but uh, the Jews considered him to be a very noble person, one of their heroes. If you look in the Old Testament to look up Cyrus, you'll see the Jews love Cyrus. He's one of the, the honorable, just per people who, who allowed the Jews to return from exile in Babylonia. So obviously that's, that makes sense that the Jews would call the Iraqis Bani uh, Koresh. So I just think what happened somewhere along the line, they hid the connection by just changing the letter. Uh, remember, we're jumping between different dialects, different scripts. It, there's lots of ways in which this would happen. The linguists among us will probably say, I'm breaking all the rules here. It doesn't work like that. But um, I'm not um, entirely convinced that the people who were writing these things were completely honest at all times. There may have been a certain manipulation of the text, perhaps, that has hit it. But in any case, that's what I think had happened. So the idea that the Kresh was connected to Iraq became forgotten as a new Islamic narrative came in to fill the holes. Now, here's another thing. Um, I'm su suggesting that there was some material that was used for the Quran and that it was originally in Aramaic. Now, the book is in Arabic now. Um, I've never picked up a French book or a German book and read in the book, hey, this is in German, this is in French. It should be obvious. It's a... Uh, it's kind of as obvious as me saying, hey, I'm Irish. You know, if you've heard my, ac my accent, you would know it. Um, but for the Quran to say, I, hey, I'm in Arabic it, and do it 10 times is a bit peculiar. And whenever I see something peculiar, that makes me investigate a little bit deeper. So as you can see here in the examples, it keeps saying over and over, it's in a clear Arabic language. Uh, this book is a confirmation in the Arabic tongue we had made if we had made it in a non-Arabic Quran, they would have said, do you notice this is the, the other side of an argument? If someone is saying is, if we did this, then blah, blah, blah. What they're really saying is, you're accusing us of making it in a non-Arabic language. And then they're trying to justify why it is in Arabic. So even just looking at the text, it's hinting that there was something before it um, connected to um, another language. Now, one objection might be, well, yes, there's a few foreign words in uh, the Quran, and that would explain why it keeps saying, no, 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 this is in the Arab tongue, but maybe there's more to it. Maybe there, it originally was in a different language. And the people at the time that the Quran was written are dealing with people saying that this is silly. We, we know it was in Aramaic before, so they have to try and, and uh, defend the book against those accus accusations. So as I said, the Quran affirms 10 times that it is in Arabic, but in the Arabic itself, the word that's used is Arabia. The Arabia tongue can simply mean the Western dialect if we, if we look at its Aramaic meaning. The Aramaic word Arabia means Western. Mandaic is a dialect of Aramaic typically found in Persia, which was closely related to Babylonian Aramaic and could easily be confused with it. Hence the, the likely need to reiterate, no, this is written in the Western Aramaic dialect, not the Eastern, boo hiss, blah, blah, you know. Um, Mandaic Aramaic was spoken and still is spoken in Kazakhstan uh, in Iran. Gabriel Salma claims that the word in Arabic is actually uh, a mistake in punctuation and it is actually, as you can see the word there, it means foreign or west of Mesopotamia. So that literally there's only a dot in the difference. So he would suggest that originally what was there wasn't the word um, Arabic, but actually it, it referred to the Arabic tongue, which uh, when we, when we say tongue rather than language, what we were talking about is the dialect. So it's saying this Quran is written in the Western dialect, not the Eastern dialect. That's essentially what people like Gabriel Salma has said. Now, if we look that in the context of a map, Mandaic, Aramaic, 
is there. Now, it also existed in other parts as well, but that's where it came from. Um, bear in mind that people were nomads as well as settled. So, you know, dialects moved around with, with, with uh, tribes and so on, but um, mostly it was in that region there. As you can see, Mandake is in the eastern part, Babylonian is in the western part. So if we assume that the Quran was written somewhere in Iraq, and it has maybe some words in Mandaic, Aramaic, perhaps they were borrowed, people might have said, um, oh, is this Mandaic Aramaic or is this Babylonian Aramaic? And the writer of the Quran or writers are saying, no, 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 this is uh, Western Aramaic. Now, Mel, I'm going to jump in here at this time. I see now that we're coming up to an hour or just a little over an hour, and we really want to make this into two different segments. <clears throat> so what I'm going to suggest is we wrap this up, this section up, this first section up, and try to give an overview of what you've just said. And then in the next episode, what we're going to do is then move on from there and look at the audience of the Quran. Who is the people exactly? And why is it significant when we look at the Mesopotamian area, this area in the eastern, the northeastern area of the Tigris and Euphrates? Who are these people that the Quran is speaking to? And why is that significant when we unpack the Quran today? So let's do a quick overview of what we've already done. Because you've done something I think that's unique, and you've done something that I don't think anybody else has really done before. Uh, and you've, what you've done is you said, let's go back to the Quran and let's look and see what exactly, who exactly, what language is it's being used. And you start out by looking at the Asiatic line uh, in chapter 74, verse 50 to 51. And you said, if you look at this Asiatic line, you notice that there is no lions in the Hijaz, Hijaz part of Arabia, in Mecca, Media. They just don't exist. But they do exist up in Iraq. They do exist in the Euphrates Valley. In Iraq, we're talking about the Mesopotamia. We're talking about the, that area between the Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers. This is where the civilization has been growing for centuries. This is the center of many of the archaic uh, dynasties and, and civilizations. And so it stands to reason then that we need to look at that area. And then you go on and continue to say that when you look at the Quran, you will see that almost much of the Quran fits that area in Iraq, not Arabia, not the Hijaz. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that the authors have to have lived in that area. I mean, you did bring up this supposition that uh, someone could have been living in Medina and have traveled and seen Asiatic lions. True, that's understandable. But you're going to get in much more depth than that by showing, yes, but let's don't just look at lions. Let's look at some other... And let's look and see where that Arabic came from. The language itself comes from the Aramaic. And you, you talk about Aramaic is the king is the king thing. Why do you say that? Well, take a look at the foreign words in the Quran. And you say that 70% of the foreign words are Aramaic. Now, that should ring a bell right there. And that should really get people's attention. If 70% of the words are Aramaic, then that suggests to me, and I'm hearing what you're saying, that should suggest to anybody listening, that good bit of the audience, the good bit of the language that was used, a good bit of the Quran when it was first written down, was probably written in that language, uh, and that still retains those words today. You gave it two examples, especially one of the Huris. Uh, that are in especially chapter 55 and chapter 56 of the Quran, these women who are there to wait upon the men in heaven. And then you say, hold on, but in the Aramaic, uh, you, you referred to Luxembourg's uh, thesis on this, in the Aramaic, this word actually means grapes. If that is the case, then those later traditions that now take and unpack the Quran and come comment on the Quran have introduced this idea that it is women, uh, these virgins, perpetual virgins, where in reality, what's waiting for uh, what's waiting for those who die and go to heaven are these grapes. And you gave the great example uh, uh, antecedent to that with Abraham holding the grapes. And you also refer to chapter 52, verse 1, and the word tur, the word tur, which are the mountains. That, but that's an Aramaic word. Jabal is the word in Arabic. It has become such a problem that even the commentators in the 10th century, remember in the 10th century now, we're talking about al tabari and others, they have to explain what Tur means because it's a foreign word that makes no sense. And why? Because this word is actually a Coptic word. This word is an Aramaic word. This word is from those in the 7th century. Again, which supports the notion that the Quran itself is talking to that language, is written in that language, and not what the later traditions want to impose on them at the Arabic. Arabic, And then I love what you do is you go to Al-Buhari, uh, one of our favorites. Of course, it's the only place you can go to to find out how the Quran was written. It's the only place that Muslims could go to to find out how the Quran is written. And you go to uh, volume six, 
Huddy's uh, number 509 and 510. We've referred to it quite a bit, but what I love is how you unpacked it. You unpack a lot of different than I've ever unpacked it. I've always assumed that this whole, this whole conflict that's going on at the time of Uthman in 652 is because those those, those Iraqis and those Syrians, those not Iraqis and Syrians, do not agree with the Qurayshi dialect. And that's what the whole conflict is about. And that's what Dr. Shabarani has been talking about. That's what all the Muslims are saying. This is nothing more than trying to bring the Quran into that great Qurayshi dialect. That's the Qurayshi dialect that exists in heaven. That's the Qurayshi dialect that was revealed to Muhammad. That's the Qurayshi dialect that Uthman spoke. And that's the Qurayshi dialect that Zaidi bin Thabit, along with the three others, all who spoke Qurayshi dialect, that's what they're supposed to write it in. But then you brought up a really interesting point. Hold on a minute. Why would there be conflict? Why would there be any disagreement? If you have any disagreement, write it in the Qurayshi dialect. What Qurayshi dialect you're saying? Now, this is lovely. This is why I love what you do, Mel. You love to work with many different things. You're not only looking at places and events, you're also looking at language. And the language you're looking here, you're looking at that word Qurayshi, and you're saying this could also be the Banu Qurayshi. The Banu Qurayshi are the... What the Jews called the people of Iraq. So it's, it's the Jewish term for the people of Iraq. Yeah. There you go. So that's Iraq again, replacing it back yeah. again. So this is fascinating. If this is the case, then you can see exactly that the language now supports the environment, which supports the place and supports the time. The time is right, because at this time, in the 7th century, they would still be up in Iraq. We haven't yet, remember, we haven't yet found out about Mecca. Mecca is not even found until 727. That's, a, that's another 100 years later. We don't know of any place called Mecca. There is no mosque facing Mecca at all until 727. Uh, the first recording, the first record of Mecca, uh, the word itself is not till 741. That's a, well over 100 years later. So this would make sense that this Qureshi, if this Qureshi word is a word that existed uh, in the, the Hijaz, then why is it we don't see reference to it? There's no reference to it at all, but it looks like it's a deformation of what they're referring to, the people they're referring to, again, in the Euphrates, the people who are from Iraq, by the Jews. This has been terrific. So now we're showing that the language is, is much further north. The language, even the words, even the internal references, 70% of the internal references in the Quran do not fit the Hijaz, do not fit Mecca Medina. They fit much further north, in this case, the Mesopotamian area, the Euphrates Valley, the Tigris in the Euphrates Valley, where, that, where what, as you've been saying, Mohammed actually comes from, from what the previous episode. Good. We're going to end it there. This has been terrific, Mel. Thanks for coming on board. Uh, you, I, mean, I, I just love the way you think. I love the way you research. And I love the fact that you're bringing up stuff that's, gonna, that's actually bringing it all down to the same narrative. And that is, folks, when you look at history, History tells us a different story than what the traditions are. Be careful of the traditions. They're written too late by people who don't know what happened, did not look at history, did not go to where the events happened, did not even go to, in this case, to the language, didn't understand the language, nor these words. Make sure you always, when the claims you make, that you can support it and source it. Mel has done that today. God bless you. Thanks for having uh, coming on board, Mel. Can't wait for the next episode. They'll be coming up next. This is Jay and Mel. Over and out. Thank you.